So you're thinking of having an abortion. And boy, you are not alone. The latest stat that I saw said that one out of every four women in the United States have an abortion. And of course, there are many more who think about it, who would never go through with it. It's on your mind. And maybe right now you're thinking, well, it's early in the pregnancy, you just found out. And now's the time to do it because, because no one will know. But I don't know about that. I don't know if, you, um, if you're familiar with a car company that no longer exists called Saturn. You see a few Saturns on the road nowadays. My, um, we had a Saturn in our family for a number of years, but I remember when Saturn was still a car company, there was a Saturn commercial on television that showed the manufacturing plant where they put the Saturn cars together and they were showing all of the employees along the assembly line putting their cars together, but uh, they weren't just putting the car together, they, they, were, they were beaming with delight when they were putting the cars together, when they were doing whatever job they each had to do on the assembly line. They, um, they were obviously enjoying themselves, just big, big smiles, like, like overdoing it, you might say, but it was, uh, they wanted it to be obvious that these people really, really enjoyed what they were doing. And then they showed the process from beginning to end as quickly as they could in a, in a short commercial, and then they showed the finished product. And as the finished product rolled out of the plant, all the people who put it together, they followed it out. They walked out and they looked at it. And one person shed a tear. <laughs> and as the car drove off, never to be seen again, another one, another one put his arm around another one of the employees and said to her, it'll be okay. It's going to a good home. <laughs> the, um, the commercial was showing that they they take pride in what they were making. They missed that car. They noticed it when it was gone. That's a car. Inside your womb is something that somebody knows is there. Because somebody put it together. And God knows it's there. In the Bible it says, it goes into pretty good detail, it says, it says God, God forms each person in the womb. God knits them together, like you yeah, knit together uh, pieces of fabric all coming together to make a, to make a beautiful, beautiful end result. That's, that's what God did. It says that God was dreaming about that life inside of your womb long before you ever knew that it was there, long before it even was there. And so if you think that, well, nobody's going to miss it if it's gone, God will miss that life. And it is a life. Even, even science backs that up. You know, they, uh, they, can, they can evaluate what's inside of your womb right now, and, and they know already, as young as, as that is, that it's, it's a unique DNA combination compared to any other person who has ever lived. It's, you have your own unique DNA, and, and what's inside your womb has its own unique DNA. It's a unique living being. God knows that. Science knows that. I think you might know that too. And what a gift that God has given you to take something that he cares so much about, that his own fingerprints, his own hands put together, and he put it into a good home. He put that into your womb. Not for you to do with, you know, whatever you want, just as you please, but to care for it as if God himself would. Because it's a creation, it's a creation of God. A God who identified your womb as the good home that it would go to. And, and how is it that you make your womb a, a good home? I guess to answer that question, I want you to think about some of the reasons some choose not to bring a child into this particular world. It's because this world hurts. It inflicts a lot of pain. There's a lot of hate, a lot of disrespect towards other lives, a lot of anger. Maybe you've even felt some of that. Maybe you've been hurt by someone, by many someones. And you never want anyone to feel that kind of pain. 
well, you have the chance to do something about it. Choosing to end the life that's in your womb. We'll just be doing the same thing that the world is already doing so well. Not caring about a life. But here you've been given the opportunity by God to give the world what it needs more than ever. Someone who can show the world or maybe even just show one life what it means when somebody chooses to love them. What it means that someone chooses to be there for them. What it means that somebody chooses to think about them. Like God thought about you long before your parents ever knew you existed. God dreamed you up to be the unique, beautiful combination of DNA that, that you are. He made you because he wanted to love you. It's a gift that he's given to you. And here you are with an opportunity to give the same gift the beautiful life that's inside of you. So you're thinking of having an abortion and you might be thinking, I'm gonna to have to do this alone. If anyone finds out what's happened here, they're, what are they gonna think of me? And I don't think I could go through that. And those are important thoughts to deal with. And to help you deal with them, I want you to think of what you would say to a young woman in this situation. She's a young woman who suddenly discovers that she's pregnant. She was not expecting it at all. She also discovers that the child inside of her womb, it's, it's not her husband's. And then the husband discovers that his wife is pregnant and he discovers that it's not his. <laughs> and so he's about ready to leave. And then they also discover that there are some very unusual circumstances with this child inside the womb, some things that make her wonder about her ability to even care for this child. And so if she came to you and asked for your advice, what would you say? I think many would give her the advice that she, could, she should very strongly consider abortion. Well, if this particular young woman would have followed through with that, her name was Mary, then she would have aborted Jesus. Jesus, the most significant religious teacher in the history of the world, and you don't need to believe in Jesus to know that. You just look at the impact that his ministry has had on so many lives. She would have aborted Jesus, the self-identified savior of the entire world. And I think one of the reasons God had Jesus come into this world in that way, in kind of a messy way, a way that wasn't that wasn't in line with the way that you would expect it to happen, nice and nice, neat and clean, is because he wanted you to know that he sees you. He knows how you feel. He wanted you to know that what's happening to you isn't outside the realm of, of what he has the ability to care for. He's been there too. And as Mary and Joseph, her husband, went through this, God also allowed us to see something else. He allowed us to see that there was help that they didn't necessarily see before all of that happened. We see that Mary found help in her family. There were probably some in their community and maybe even some within 
their family or extended family that heard the news and wasn't quite sure what to think and kept their distance for a while, but there was at least one relative who embraced Mary in her unusual situation with, with open arms. It was her cousin, Elizabeth, and she spent a lot of time with her. She spent a lot of time with family, and I'm sure Elizabeth was as surprised as Mary was when she got the news about what was happening. And I bet when you tell family the news of what's happening, they might be surprised too. But I think you might also be surprised by how eager they are to embrace you. They're not going to push you away. You'll find some, maybe not all, but some who are so eager to be there for you. And then there's another place where you can look and find the same thing. In the Bible, there's a group of people that's, it, it describes how they interacted with one another. And it says that they had everything in common. They gathered together regularly. They, they sold their possessions so that they could be in a better position to help those who were in need. And do you know a group of people that is describing? That's describing a church. There were people who believed in Jesus and they gathered together and they cared more about one another than they cared about themselves. They were eager to help those who were in need. And there are so many different churches out here today that are eager to do the same thing. None of them will treat one another perfectly. None of us can. But if you're looking for the best place to look for somebody who will treat you well when you are in need, Go to the places that intentionally celebrate the fact that God gave the world himself to love us in our times of need. Go to the places that talk about the heart of God and the gift of Jesus. And you are far more likely to find people who live with the heart of God and eager to give a gift like God gave us in Jesus. And then... Whatever help you find within your family, whatever help you find within a church that are eager to be there for you, there's one place that I know you will always find help. In fact, Joseph discovered that. So Joseph was the husband of Mary who suddenly discovered that his wife was pregnant and he had nothing to do with it. He knew that because he hadn't yet been with her. He hadn't yet slept with her. And so when he heard the news, he thought, this isn't good. This isn't a good way to start a relationship. And he was on his way out the door, but God sent him a message. In a very special way, God sent him a message. It was an angel that came to Joseph and said, and said, and said, Joseph, I know this is surprising, but don't be afraid of the situation. It's going to be okay. What's in Mary's womb is from God. It's a baby, a boy, who's going to grow up to save the world from all of its brokenness. And then the angel said to Joseph, and this is what you will call the baby or what the baby will be called. The baby will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And do you know what the name Emmanuel means? It means God is with us. God is with us. Mary got to discover that in a very unique way. She carried God inside her womb. But you and your child will also get to discover that too. Family and friends may be there to help you. Other Christians might be there to help you. But God will most certainly be there with you. It's exactly what he promised to do through the child that Mary was carrying. And you'll see it play out in the life of the one you are too. So you're thinking of having an abortion and you're thinking ahead a little bit to when the baby would be born and the financial impact and the life impact because a baby changes everything. Babies are insanely expensive, raising them from, from birth to, to college and, and beyond. And it changes your schedule, it changes your routines, it changes your plans that you had for your life. 
and you just don't know if you're ready to go through with all of that, or even if you can. Well, I want you to think back at a couple of years. Think back to your 16th birthday. And imagine that for your 16th birthday, somebody bought you a car, like a nice car. Um, I don't know what your definition of a nice car is, but let's just say it's like a, like a $50,000 car. Really sweet looking. And it's, they take you outside, it's there, it's, it's in the driveway, and they say, it's yours. We got this for you, for your birthday. It was expensive, we sacrificed, it was, you know, it was great, uh, but we were glad to do it because we, we want you to have this car. And you are thrilled. You did not see this coming. And so you go to the car and you open the door and you close the door and, uh, and you hold out your hand to get the keys from the person who gave you the car. And they give you a funny look. Like, like why are you doing that? Why are you holding out your hand? And you say, because, well, I, I need the keys to use the car. And they say, well, we weren't going to give you the keys. <laughs> we just wanted you to have the car. Would that happen? <laughs> no, nobody buys someone a car and then refuses to give them the keys. Like nobody buys the bigger thing and then fails to give you the smaller things that you will need in, act in order to actually use that bigger thing. Well, the same principle applies with the life that God placed inside of your womb. That life is a big thing. It's massive. It's huge. God put it there. And if God gave you the big thing, he's not going to fail to also provide the smaller things so that the smaller things that that life can use and will need so that that life can be useful as it continues to go through life. There's a passage in the Bible in, um, in one of the portions of the Bible called Matthew, written by a disciple of Jesus named Matthew where Jesus is talking and he quotes Jesus as, as saying, isn't life more important than food and isn't, isn't, isn't the body more important than, um, than clothes? You know, life and the body, those are the big things. God knows that. And he also knows that our lives and our bodies, we need food and we need clothing. And so he was saying, I'm, I'm not going to fail to provide the smaller things that your life needs in order to keep going. God gave you the big thing. He'll also give you the small things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be the one who will provide those smaller things for the life inside your womb. You know, right now, if you were to go around the world and just look at all the children in the world, if you could, millions of those children right now are children who have been adopted. Millions of them. They grew in one woman's womb. But they're being raised by someone different for any number of reasons. But that's okay. And right now in the world, if you were to go around the world and if you were to look at all the adults in the world at the same time, do you know what you would see? You'd see millions of adults who are hoping and praying for a child that they can adopt. That's who you would see. But whether it's you or somebody else who's raising that child, God will not fail to provide everything that the life and the body of that child, everything that they need. But whether it's you or somebody else, there's one thing you need to keep in mind about the future while it's on our minds. And that point that you need to keep in mind about the future is this. You don't need to know the details of the future in order to feel good walking into it. There's another story in the Bible that, that, that teaches that lesson. It's about a woman named Hagar. And Hagar, Hagar had a son uh, born in a, a very tense relationship, very complex. And it came to the point that Hagar was being kicked out of the house. And Hagar was being forced to take her son with her. And Hagar wasn't going to leave her son behind. But 
But so Hagar and her son were kicked out of the house. And they lived in a place that was pretty much all desert. And so they left with no support, with no help. They went out into the desert and Hagar tried to live and provide for her son along the way. But eventually came to the point where she had nothing left to give. She had no more resources. Everything was used up. No money, no food for her or for her son. With the little bit that she did have left, she, she gave them one, one last meal. And she knew that was going to be it. And she couldn't bear the thought of watching her son die from starvation. And so she took her son and placed him underneath a bush. And the boy started crying. And so did she. As she walked away in the other direction. Because she could not bear to see what was about to happen. But then something happened that she wasn't expecting. God spoke to her from heaven and said, Hagar, why are you crying? A question that would have been easy for her to answer. <laughs> but then God said, you don't need to be afraid, Hagar. I have heard the boy crying. God was listening from heaven and he heard the boy crying. He heard his tears and then he did something else. And then he said, Hagar, go, go pick up your son and go in that direction, pointed her in a direction. And then it says that God opened her eyes so that she saw a spring of water so that the two of them who had been dying literally of, of thirst were able to get a drink of wonderful, wonderfully refreshing water. And she didn't see it before. She didn't know it was there. But God did. And God opened her eyes so that she could see something different that she didn't even know to look for. And then it says, it kind of tells us the rest of the story in a very short time, that they continued to live in the desert, that they grew up in the desert. So obviously they, they found food and water somehow in the desert. Um, it says that the son, whose name was Ishmael, he became an archer. So that became his profession. He found meaningful work that filled him up with good things in the desert. And it also says that in the desert, mom eventually found a nice young lady that her son could marry. And so he even ended up finding a spouse in the desert. And would you ever expect to go out into the desert and find enough food and water to live for your entire life and meaningful work that'll fill you up with joy every single day and also a spouse <laughs> in the desert? They didn't even know to look for those things. They didn't know those things were in their future. But God did. God knew. Just like he knows what you will need in your future. And he has promised to give whatever is needed both to you and to your child. That's another promise that God gives in the Bible. He points us to a gift that God has already given. The life of Jesus, whose entire life was dedicated to loving others and sacrificing everything he had, even his own life, to make sure that we would have everything we need forever. And it says, if God didn't even spare Jesus, if he didn't even hold back the, his most valuable possession and he gave that to us, that's big. And if he gave us the big thing, whatever other things you need, whatever other things your child needs, whether or not you can see them coming, God already knows how they will. God will not fail to provide all that you need. So you're thinking about abortion and if you're thinking about the future, you're probably thinking, well, what'll happen if I go through with it? How will I feel if I go through with it? And based on a lot of conversations with a lot of people, with women who've been in your situation, I, I think I can confidently say that 
You're going to hurt. You're going to hurt. A number of years ago, I read a story about a, a mom who had just given birth to a new baby boy. And she was in the hospital and it was the day after she had given birth and she was nursing, nursing the child. And, and as soon as she got done nursing the child, the door to her hospital room swung open and three official looking people come in and, and they look at her and they say, I'm sorry, ma'am, but that's not your child. It turns out that in the middle of the previous night, after she had gotten done nursing the child again and wanting, uh, and then wanted to get some sleep, the nurses, as they so often very kindly do, they, they took the baby, took the baby and placed the baby in the nursery. And every child in the nursery is assigned their own crib with their name on it and their ID and, and everything like that. But it, for whatever reason, when the nurses took the child back to the nursery, they put the baby in the wrong crib. And then there was another baby who had also been nursing at the same time. And when that baby came back into the nursery, was brought back into the nursery, they were put into the crib of, of the child that belonged to this mother. And so the next morning when it was time to nurse the children again, they rolled the cribs with the children's name into their rooms where the cribs were supposed to be. But the babies had been switched. And so that mom had just gotten done nursing somebody else's child. And another mom had just gotten done nursing her son. And so it was, it was fixed. But many months after it had happened, it still rattled her of how quickly and easily the child was taken out of her hands. But again, it was, it was corrected. Abortion is an act that cannot be corrected. It is very final. You have to live with it. You cannot undo it. And as you try to live with it, the reality of it, maybe now you believe that the child inside your womb is a child, the, the unique DNA that both God and science recognize as a unique living DNA, that that is a child. But, but even if you don't, the possibility will cross your mind. You will wonder if it is. And then you'll, you'll start to think about how you're supposed to feel. About you taking that child in a sense, out of God's hands and placing them into your own, but of course not keeping them there. But getting rid of that child. That's going to hurt. In some ways you might be able to anticipate in many ways that you don't know how to anticipate. Some women have experienced that feeling of even the wondering if they really did end another human life. Some have experienced, uh, said that they described it as like, like, like an entire building is sitting on top of your heart. It's the full weight of it, right on top of their fragile heart. And you know what it's like to have an entire building sit on top of you? Some people do. Back in 2011, there was an earthquake in the country of Turkey, pretty big one, 7.2 magnitude. And, and where the earthquake was, it, it just decimated everything. Houses and buildings, and they came, they came tumbling down, massive destruction, many lives lost, many others displaced, and they had to live in temporary tent cities for a, for a very long time as the cleanup began, it started happening. But after the earthquake happened and after the, the dust had settled, you might say, they, uh, they wanted to clean up as quickly as they could. And so they started sending cleanup crews in the, uh, the next day already. And they worked. They worked for a day and then they got into the second day. And 48 hours after the earthquake, 
Somebody was working near a seven-story building that had collapsed, and they thought they heard something from underneath the building. They thought they heard a baby cry. And they didn't ignore that cry. They, uh, they dug and they dug and they dug and got a lot of help. And eventually they, they found the source of the sound of the baby cry. And it was indeed a baby. Two weeks old. Her name was Azra. And she was alive and healthy like untouched by the seven-story building that had fallen on top of her. And do you know why? Because they found her in her mother's arms. Her mother was in the building with her newborn daughter when the earthquake happened. And when the ground started shaking, she, she grabbed her daughter and, and wrapped her in her arms and and they both fell to the very bottom underneath this seven-story building and somehow both survived. Mom survived too. She was able to walk away from it amazingly. But I want you to imagine for a moment how that mom would feel if she had not reached for her child when the earthquake started. And what the result of that would be if the building had fallen on both of them. Except the mother's body wasn't there to protect the body of that little baby. But if mom had survived, well, two things. Azra would never grow up having a beautiful picture of what it's like to love someone. Because that's what her mom did. She loved her simply by holding on to her and protecting her and keeping her safe. And, and secondly, mom would have to go through the rest of her life carrying the guilt that comes with wondering, what if? What if I had scooped my baby in my arms? What if I had done something different? What if I could change what I did back then, the decision I made? And that guilt is a guilt that God does not want you to live with. In fact, he doesn't want you to live with any guilt. Because I know you feel guilty about other things already in your life. There are things in your life that you're not proud of. There are people in your life that you haven't always treated well. There are decisions that you've already made that you don't feel good about. And as often as you think about them, they put a weight on your heart. Well, I want you to imagine that somebody would come up to you and invite you to give the full weight of everything you feel guilty about to them. Like imagine that everything that you feel guilty about is sitting on top of your heart like a seven-story building. And imagine that they come up to you and, and they just lift it off your heart. And they don't just throw it away, but instead they, they put it on their own heart. And they say, let me carry that for you. Well, that's what Jesus did. That's why God put little baby Jesus in the womb of Mary. That's why he wanted little baby Jesus to live. And his life was the kind of life that this world has never seen before or since. Because it's, he had nothing to feel guilty about. He had no guilt of his own. He never did anything wrong. And this person who never did anything wrong, who never had anything to feel guilty about, who's never felt the weight of guilt that you and I feel so often, he came into this world and, and he said, I'll take that from you. And he did. He took it off your heart and he put it on his own heart. And the Bible says that he was crushed 
by it. He was crushed for our iniquities, is what the Bible says. And that word iniquities, we don't use very often or at all, but it's a word that simply means the things that we feel guilty about. Jesus was crushed by them. He was crushed by them as he hung on a cross and died and gave his life. And then those iniquities were buried with him in a grave. But then on the third day after he died, Jesus came alive again. But the iniquities, the guilt, they stayed behind. He buried them. He was free of them. And so were you. So are you. God does not want you to live with guilt. It is a painful place to be. And he gives us the guidance that he does in his word to protect life, to look out for one another, to defend those who are really most vulnerable and can't defend themselves because he knows how we feel when we do the opposite. He will always feel guilt. He wanted you to be free from. And he also came because he wanted to give you someone that you could follow, that you know, absolutely without a doubt, would never fail to love you, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you've ever done. He wanted you to feel safe. He wanted every life, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how visible, no matter how yet unseen, to feel safe in the best, most loving arms of all. His. I don't know if watching this has been easy or difficult for you, but, but thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to let you know that God loves you. I love you. We love you. And we're here to help. Reach out. God is thinking of you. And so are we. My friends, we're here to help. If you or someone you know is struggling to understand the topic of abortion better from God's Word, we have resources available. Please visit timeofgrace.org abortion.